side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus will save you Hello Church, I'm Anthony Greco and together with my wife, Madeleine, we pastor Calgary Life Church together. We're so delighted that you are watching us on this program today as uh, we bring the Word of God to you. We've started a series last, a few weeks ago called uh, The Great Reset. And uh, no, it's not a political statement. Uh, it's really about getting an opportunity to reset all the way back to the very beginning, discovering God's in original intention for you, for me, for the church, what he's doing on the earth today. And I'm reminded of uh, the great football coach, Vince Lombardi, who back in the 1960s took a failing Green Bay Packers team and transformed them into a two-time uh, uh, Super Bowl championship, several, you know, league championships. And, you know, Vince Lombardi walks into the, as the story goes, walks into the dressing room of this, uh, this team of professional athletes, and he brings in a football. And he starts off by saying, this is a football. And everybody, of course, was dumbfounded as why would this coach insult our intelligence? Doesn't he know that we were college pros, that we are in the NFL, we are professionals? But he brought them right back to basics. This is a football. And by just going back to discovering the basics of team, tenacity, strategy, you know, the basics of the game, he transformed that team into a championship team and his legend lives on. Uh, Vince Lombardi died, I believe it was 1970. Now, uh, today, I want to uh, share with you, this is a Bible. <laughs> yes, this is the Word of God. With all that's going on in the world today, 
especially in the church world. People are off on tangents and people are off on all kinds of peripheral. It's my passion, my desire to see our church, Calvary Life Church, become a championship team. And how are we gonna do that? Let's get back to basics. This is our Bible. It is the Word of God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. It's called the Scriptures. Jesus said, if you'll hear these Scriptures and put them into practice, you'll be like a person that built their house on a rock. They dug down deep. The storms of life came and they survived. That house remained standing. It's our desire to see your life, your family, your financial house, you know, and all the different metaphors. We want to see your life stand strong and firm in the midst of all the storms and the uncertainties that we live in today. And my friends, the good news is God is for you. He loves you. And it is possible to live a great life. So our scripture verse is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, which is also known as the Great Commission. Jesus said, this is the mission of the church. This is what every church is all about. Now, our mission statement is win, plant, grow, multiply, four simple words. We want you to win in life. We want people that are far from God to be won over to his love. We want you to be planted. We wanna see you bear great fruit in your life. And we know that comes from being rooted, having a foundation, having your roots down in the word of God and in Christ. We wanna see you grow and flourish because that's when life gets really exciting is when things are happening and you're producing fruit. And then of course, multiplication. Come on, we want you to live a God-sized life and we get to do this together. So that's our mission statement. And there's all kinds of other different mission statements that are you know, uh, equally valid and creative, but ultimately they're all rooted in that scripture in Matthew 28. Let's read it. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now we talked about the difference between being a disciple and a believer. And so if you're interested, you, I encourage you to check out last week's message to understand what is it that separates a believer from a disciple. Because Jesus didn't say to make decisions or believers, he said, make disciples. And then he says, of all nations. Man, I believe that we are to influence every aspect of society from arts and education to politics to sports. I mean, everything. We as the church ought to be the salt and the light, bringing out the God flavors and getting the God colors in every area. We ought to be active in ministering to the poor and defending those that are being unjustly treated. You know, that's the picture of the church. But what I love about this is going to all the, go preach the, make disciples of all nations. I believe we're called, you know, worldwide. We got a global mandate, a global missions for each and every one of us. But look at, the, look at the next part of that verse. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I love the fact that Jesus is with his church, that Jesus has committed himself to the, the, the fulfillment of the Great Commission. We don't have to try to do it with our own personal charisma, technology, willpower, resources. The good news is this is that Jesus he said he'd be with us. Come on, that's why some of you are watching here today because Jesus is at work. He's drawing you, he's calling you, he's got a plan for you. Jesus is with the church that's committed to making disciples, sharing the good news. He's here present with us. But today's message, I wanna focus on that second part of the mandate. The first was make disciples of the nations, but then he said baptizing them immediately from making disciples, it's about baptizing. And there are several baptisms that are mentioned in the New Testament, and we're gonna talk about the three that are the ones that really refer to each and every one of you and, and myself as believers. And so we're gonna talk about that today. These are critical steps in our discipleship making process. I'm not getting really fancy, not gonna get really deep, or this is gonna be so simple. I'm simply gonna open up the scripture, so please, if you're on the online platform, our notes are available. If you're on our Calgary Life Church website, get on there and follow along. There's gonna be a lot of scriptures because I'm just gonna go back to the very beginning. This is our Bible. Come on, this is our playbook to become a winning team and to win our championship. 
And I, I listen, I believe every one of us are on that team today. So there's four things that are critical to this uh, in this passage of scripture, and it really reveals the will of God. So I'm gonna give you four things about the will of God that includes you and me today. And you say, well, I'm not even a member of Calvary Life Church. I don't even know if I'm a believer. Great, this still concerns you. These four things, this is gonna help you to know God's will. Okay, number one, it is God's will for you to be saved. Okay, stop right there. Saved, what does that word even mean? You know, I remember when I was a kid, someone wrote on a, on a, on a wall one day, you know, Jesus saved and somebody else, you know, wrote, you know, uh, but Gretzky gets the rebound and scores, you know, and people talk about having a come to Jesus moment, moment or being born again. What does that word saved really mean? All right, in, in the Greek, that word is precious. Beautiful, comes from the root word sozo, soteria, where we get salvation. It means wholeness. It means forgiveness, redemption, uh, deliverance, being made whole, being blessed. It's an incredible word. And this word salvation or saved, really it has two sides to it. There's something that we're saved out of and there's something we're saved into. So for example, uh, we are, uh, we're saved out of being lost. You know, I, I was lost, but I was, you know, I was lost and now I'm found. I, you know, I lost my purpose. Or maybe you lost your sense of purity. Maybe you lost your direction. Maybe you lost your self-respect or self-worth. You know what, Jesus came to save not just the lost, but the scripture says that which was lost. What have you lost? I've made a mess of my, of my family. I've lost my family. I've, lo I've lost, you know, listen, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus can put the pieces back together. That's good news. He saves us from uh, uh, condemnation, from the power of sin, from addiction, you know, from feeling worthless. He saves us from shame, from darkness, from curses, you know, and if you're feeling that your life is jinxed and nothing has ever worked out going your way, I want you to know that Jesus has the love and the power to turn things away. That's what we're saved out of. But what are we saved into? Well, the good news is, is that we're saved into peace. You can have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you can have the peace of God that in the midst of the storm, like Jesus, when he was in the boat with his disciples and the storm came, he was asleep with his head on a pillow. In the midst of your storm, you can discover the peace that comes from God, that passes understanding. It'll protect your heart and protect your mind. You don't have to be a victim in the season that we're living in. What are you saved to? You're saved to peace. You're saved into righteousness, into purity. Wow, God can erase the stains and the shame of sin and on the inside work a miracle so that you feel as pure as a newborn baby, innocent and come on, just completely cleansed from sin and shame. That's what you're saved into, into righteousness, right standing with God, being in the presence of God without any sense of sin, guilt or inferiority, saved into confidence. Oh, what a great way to live your life confidence. You can regain your confidence. These are all little ideas of what it means to be saved. And of course, blessing. You come into fellowship with God. You get to know God. You get to have relationship with God. God no longer becomes a doctrine, but he becomes a person to you, a father who cares about every aspect of your life. There's a couple of scriptures. First one is John 3, 16 and verse 17. Jesus said, for God so loved the world. Oh, I like that. He hasn't, he hasn't excluded anybody of any gender or nationality or religion. He includes you. You are included in God's plan. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Come on, you don't, you're not, you don't need to just fade away and fizzle out and perish, man, but you can have eternal life. What is God called? What's, what's the will of God for you? That you have eternal life. What's that? That's the God kind of life. And eternal life is knowing God. It's a relationship with God, according to John 17, three. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Oh, I like that. God's not condemning or judging the world. He's calling the world into relationship and to discover freedom and a whole new level of living. He wants that for you, my friend. And let me give you a couple other scriptures real quick. Second Peter 3, 9 says, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's God's will for you right now? 
you should repent from trying to save yourself, religion, and come and discover the new life that you can have in Christ. First Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the plan of God? Man, he wants everybody. God takes no pleasure in the death or the penalty of the wicked. God rejoices when love wins. Last verse, Romans chapter 10, verse 19. You say, well, how, okay, well, if that's the will of God, how do, I, how do I get saved? Is it through water baptism? Is that what I need to be saved? Or church membership, good works? How do I even know? Well, Paul tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's so simple. It's right near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, one confesses unto salvation. So my friend, my question for you today is, have you ever confessed Jesus? Have you ever been born again? Have you ever had a fresh start? Have you ever experienced salvation? So that's your first step is right here, right now. You can pray and invite Christ into your life. Confess him as your Lord. Believe that God raised him from the dead. And my friend, you will experience the greatest miracle. You'll become a new person on the inside, born again, a new creation. And you can, you can if you're online right now, there's somebody, if you're on, on our Facebook uh, or our online CLC website, there's somebody waiting to introduce you. If not, send us an email. We'd love to send you some information to help you to get grow. So that's the get growing in your newfound faith. That's the first point of God's will for your life. Now let's get into the baptism part. The second uh, point of what is God's will for your life is God's will for you is to be water baptized. Now, when the church was started in Acts chapter two, here's what happened. Uh, Peter, you know, on the day of Pentecost, God pours out his Holy Spirit and, and Peter, who becomes the leader of the church in the very beginning with a small uh, other cohort, including James and a few others. And uh, he preaches the great, you know, Pentecostal sermon, the first gospel message uh, in the church age. And, he's, and then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the, name of, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What did he say? Repent, be baptized. The very first thing he said was get baptized, water baptized. Well, you can go through the scriptures. Philip, one of the first evangelists, goes to Samaria, which were the, you know, a mixed race that were really, you know, discriminated against by the Jewish people. Philip goes there and he preaches the gospel. In verse 12, it says, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. <gasps> so this isn't just for men, this is for men and women. Now, note carefully that, you know, it didn't say children. And this is an important thing to recognize is that nowhere in the scriptures do we see children being baptized. We see them being dedicated, but we don't see them being baptized. Hence, we don't baptize babies. We don't bap we dedicate them like the scriptures teach. Later on, Philip in that same chapter, chapter eight in the book of Acts, uh, he meets a uh, Ethiopian uh, eunuch and, uh, he be and, and he overhears him uh, reading from Isaiah chapter 53 about the suffering Messiah. And so uh, Philip, you know, jumps up on the, the spirit, you know, nudges Philip. He jumps on the, up in the chariot with him and, and preaches Christ to him from the scriptures. And then uh, uh, in verse 36, it says, now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Man, what are the conditions to be baptized? Here's, a, here's a, uh, this Ethiopian, here's the message of Jesus and says, here's water, what hinders me? What are the qualifications? Do I have to wait a certain amount of time, take some courses? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Well, see, babies can't believe with all their heart. You know, usually when they're baptized as a baby, there's a godparent that stands, you know, you know, on their behalf until they come of age. Well, why do we need to complicate, add all these things that just aren't in the scriptures? Here's, a, here's the, great, uh, the, the, the great qualifier. If you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can be baptized. And then it goes on to say in verse 38, so when he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized into him, and he baptized him. Didn't sprinkle them. He didn't just, here's a glass of water. No, they went, they went down into the water. We believe in full immersion. All right, why is that? That's the Bible pattern. Okay, this is a Bible, all right? We're following this book. All right, why be baptized? Let me give you a few points real quick. Uh, number one, because Jesus commanded it. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. 
So that's the first step. Hey, I love Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. He's my example. He was baptized by John the Baptist. You know, he commands us to be baptized. That's the first thing. If you love Jesus and you're a follower of Jesus, come on, sign up today. We're going to get you baptized. Number two, because it's your public declaration of your faith. That in many cultures around the world today, you know, in, in North America, in the Western world, we often do this, you know, raise your hand if you want to receive Christ or come to the front, but you don't find that anywhere in the scriptures. Uh, I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm not saying it's not a great tool. However, in the scriptures and in many cultures around the world today, the true conversion point is water baptism. And, and uh, following the Bible, I would have to agree, that is the real conversion point where you publicly, you know, I, I believe when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, I believe you're saved, the miracle happens, but that water baptism is your public declaration. That's your public, you know, uh, uh, affirmation of your conversion. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 10. It's verse 32 and 33. Jesus said, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Uh, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus makes it very clear. Man, you need to make a public testimony of your faith in Christ. We're not undercover believers, secret disciples, you know. Uh, we are very bold and very clear with our witness and with our faith in Christ for everything he's done for us. Number three, it's a transition. Why should I be water baptized? Well, it's the will of God. Jesus commanded it, right? It's your public declaration is the second point. Third point is, it's a transition. First Corinthians chapter 10, first two verses. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and the sea. Now, Paul opens up this passage in 1 Corinthians 10 saying that what happened to Israel coming out of Egypt, they were less, was an encouragement, an example for us. And so he's talking about the passing of the Red Sea is kind of a picture of water baptism. Well, what did the, what did the Israelites experience? We well, remember they were living in 400 years of slavery. When they crossed that Red Sea, that was it. Their ordeal was over. The power of their former oppressor was once and forever broken. Uh, the Egyptian army was drowned and Pharaoh could no longer reach them. And they left the land of slavery and they were entering into the land of promise. Now it's interesting, you know, Pharaoh and Egypt and, the, and Pharaoh's army speaks of the world, the flesh and the devil, its power was broken. And when you get baptized, it's a transition. You're leaving your old life of slavery. You're leaving that old life where sin and darkness and shame, that old Pharaoh had power and authority over you and you are free to come into the land of promise, a land where milk and honey flows. Egypt is always called the land of leeks and garlic, which I don't think is a negative because personally, I love my leeks and my garlic. Man, oh man, leek and potato soup, some shocking good, my son. All right, that's for my new few friends. All right, w what do I love about, you know, I mean, uh, garlic is amazing, but it, notice that when it refers to Egypt, it's talking about vegetation that grows from the ground up. It's from the ground up. But the promised land was a land where milk and honey flow, right? It's from the top down. In other words, it's a heavenly blessing. And that's a picture of a land of abund abundance. Water baptism is that transition. You say bye-bye to your old life, goodbye to the life of slavery and the old powers that used to hold you captive are broken once and for all through the cross of Jesus Christ. You've been set free. You got a new identity, you got a new father, and you got a whole new land to live in. So why wouldn't you get water baptized? Which brings me to my fourth point. It speaks of identification. It is a new identification. Romans chapter six says this, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, or united with him in his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. At baptism, you are united with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And even as Jesus walks in resurrection life, you and I are invited to participate in newness of life. You get a new life. Come on, someone, someone may have told you, get a life. Why don't, don't just get any life, get the life of God, get the life of Christ, get an overcoming life that death in the grave has no claim upon. All right, and number five, it's an outward declaration of an inward miracle. It's a window into your soul to see what really happened 
when you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth. Look what it says in Colossians chapter two. It says, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God. Wow, there was a working of God when you gave your life to Christ. Salvation is a miracle. Who raised him from the dead and you having, uh, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having been forgiven all your trespasses. Wow. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross. At the cross of Jesus, man, your slate was wiped clean. Baptism is that picture of you being identified with Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a miracle. God, by the opera, his, his working in your life, made you new. And that's the same picture that we see there. All right, so your action step for you then is, uh, what hinders you from being baptized today? Man, if you were, uh, uh, you know, send an email to our office. And if you happen to be seeing this on a Sunday morning, then, uh, you know, different people in different time zones in different countries are seeing this at a different time. But if you're in the Calgary area, man, you can be here by 1.30 uh, to this afternoon. Man, we'd love to put you on that list. We have a whole slew of people getting water baptized. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And if not, send us an email. If you're on online, hey, we can actually work away on doing this online as well because we're not limited. The Word of God is never bound. All right. Let's get on to the third point. We're almost done. God's will is for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's the third thing of God's will, is for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be empowered to live a life that is clearly a witness for Jesus. And remember when Jesus, and maybe you're not aware, but in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, when John the Baptist points out Jesus, he says, hey, I baptize you with water, but that guy there, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the first thing that John the Baptist says about Jesus, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, he's been raised from the dead. He's about to go back to heaven to be seated at the Father's right hand. He's about to pour out the Holy Spirit on his church. And listen to what he says to those original disciples. He says, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They, they were politically minded, just like a whole lot of Christians today in our world. And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put under his own authority, but you shall receive, I like that. You know what, I just leave that with, a, leave, that's in the Father's authority, here's what we need to do. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, the day you received Christ, by the Holy Spirit, you got born again. The Spirit of God fused the life of Jesus to you on the inside. You might've been dead in sins, He made you alive. My friend, when you got born again, you were born again of the Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit. But this is a secondary act, a secondary work of grace. When the Spirit comes upon you, when you are baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit, you receive power for, for uh, you know, to, to be a witness. Holy Spirit doesn't come to start a new denomination, but he comes to bring us into a new demonstration, into a new dynamics of the, of the presence of God in our life. And you know, I know there's always two miles of ditches for every one mile of road. You got one on the extreme that says, oh, the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, that passed away with the apostles. Once we've got the canon of Scripture, they were not needed anymore. They're called cessationists. Then you have the other extreme, you know, on the Pentecostal side, they say, unless you speak in tongues, you're, you're not going to heaven, you know. And, uh, you know, I think it's so important we just let the Scripture speak. I think balance is important. Let's get back to this book here. Listen to what Peter said, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And 39. Then Peter said to them, this is again on that first time, that first Pentecostal message, uh, day of Pentecost when he preached the gospel. He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you. See, some stop right there. See, that was just for the, the apostles. But then Peter continues to write, he goes, this, this promise is to you and to your children 
Oh, some said, see, it's only for the early church, you know, and just for the people in Jerusalem at that time. But he continues, and to all who are far off. Okay, so well, it's beyond Jerusalem. I guess it was just for the early Roman Empire. And then P Peter says, you don't get it. He says, as many as the Lord our God will call. In other words, he doesn't put a time ref uh, restraint. He doesn't put a geographical limitation. This gift of the Holy Spirit, it's for all of us. You can experience the power of the Spirit in your life today. So look at, at Acts chapter two, first four verses, we have the story, what happened the day of Pentecost. In verse four it says, and they were, uh, in verse three it says, and they were all, appeared to them divided tongues of fire and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wow, yeah, you might be thinking, what? Martha, run, they're gonna bring out the snake handlers next. I know it sounds wild and out there, but my friend, this is, this is normal Christianity. This is uh, what Jesus taught, said these signs shall follow them that believe. And one of the things was they'll speak in tongues. And there's different kinds of tongues. There's, there's tongues as a different language. And we've had a fellow in our church, uh, Steve Hawkins is his name, who learned, uh, who learned one language, you know, uh, China, uh, Mandarin, I believe it was, but he got 14 other languages by the Holy Spirit, including Russian, Italian, Swedish, Hindi, Urdu, and just a gift from God. There's also the tongues that's used for in a message where someone will stand up and say something in tongues and someone else will give the interpretation. Then there's the tongues that Paul talks about, the, the gift, the only gift of the Spirit that builds you up and uh, it edifies you in your most holy faith. And that one's for personal edification and you're praying the perfect will of God. But that's another sermon, another time. Let me just close with this asking you, have you received the power of the Holy Spirit? And if you haven't, there's someone ready to pray for you. We'd love for you. You know, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. So I'll encourage you, ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. And the last point is this, with this we close, uh, God's will. So the first one was for you to, to, to know Christ, to be born again. Number two, to be water baptized. Number three, will of God is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God wants you to live a life of power and influence. And the fourth one is this, is that God's will is for you to be baptized into the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we've all been made to drink into one spirit. You know what, you know what God wants to do? You know, you know it's the work of the spirit in your life. He wants you to be part of a spiritual family. He wants you to be immersed, connected with a body. There's no, you know, uh, maverick Christianity or independent Christianity. We're called to live in community with each other. In Acts chapter two, verse 47, it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. People that were experiencing this miracle of a resurrected Christ and a new life. What did Jesus do with them? He added them to the church. And that was a really popular, you know, it's in vogue right now to really, you know, dog the church and to really speak against the church. And oh, the church is dying. It's the end of the church age in North America. You know, listen, I'm just telling you, you know what Jesus is doing? He's adding to his church. You know what he's doing to our church? He's adding like, you know, like there's so many people that are coming you know, online and in person, we're just so thrilled that Jesus is adding. He wants to add you to a family. He wants you to find your tribe. And then the last verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. Not only is, is the spirit baptizing you into family, he wants you to find your tribe and that Jesus is adding you to a church, to a local church. If you haven't found one yet, you know, I, you know I'd pray that you just, you know, uh, seek God where God wants you to be and, and find that place. And I hope it's with us, you know, you're welcome to join the journey with us. But in this last verse, it says, but God has set the members each one of them in the body. Not only does God set you in the body, He's got a perfect fit for you. You've got giftings, you've got passions, you've got abilities that are just gonna dovetail with somebody else here. We're building a winning team here at Calgary Life Church, a family, a spiritual family, as we pursue God's purposes for our lives. And we invite you to come and find your fit. We we'll say, well, what's my next step? Your next step is to sign up for a starting point. And uh, we do this uh, peer, about two, well, uh, every two months, we invite people, we share about who we are as a church, an opportunity for guests to, us to get to know you. We do them online now as well. We'd love to share with you. And one of the things we do is, is uh, do a discovery class where we help you to discover what is the spiritual gifts that are inside of you. All right, and then just where you fit on the team because we just would love to have you be a part of our winning team. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you today for this opportunity. Holy Spirit, I know you're moving right now. You're speaking to people to open up their hearts, to discover a new life, a new beginning. So Jesus, thank you 
that they say yes right now. Amen. Thank you for watching, everybody. God bless you. We'll see you next week. If you made the decision today to follow Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. So the next thing that we want you to do is jump onto the CLC website or CLC app and fill out a Connect card. You'll see a little box on there that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. Check that off and one of us will reach out to you and help walk you through these next steps. We'd also like to send you one of these red bags right here. It's just got a couple different resources to help you out as you begin this walk with God, including a New Testament Bible, a little book called Why Jesus, and some teachings from Pastor Anthony. So make sure you do that. And again, we're so happy for you. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ben. And I'm Michaela. And if it's your first time joining us, either online or in person, we would love for you to fill out a Connect card. And you can do that by filling it out online on our church app, or if you're in person, you can come see us at our Connect desk and you can fill one out there. We believe that when things get dark, we are meant to shine even brighter. That's why in seasons like this, we believe the church is more important than ever before. Your faithful generosity goes so far in helping us do what we get to do as a church. Yes, and if you would like to give today, you can give online through our church app, or if you're in person, you can give at one of our giving stations in the hallway. Your generosity is changing lives. If you've just recently started attending Calgary Life Church, or you would love to get connected, you can join us online or in person on February the 21st for our starting point. This is a great opportunity to meet the pastors or get more information about what we do here at Calgary Life Church. On Sunday, February 14th, that's right, Valentine's Day is coming up, guys, so make sure this is your note from us. We are excited to have the lead pastors of Hillsong Phoenix, Terry and Judith Chris, bringing the word. Whether you're online or in person, you're going to be hearing this awesome message that we believe is going to impact your life and the people around you. So this is a great Sunday to invite your friends and family to join you for one of our awesome services. We have a CLC online Facebook group, which is a great way for you to stay engaged with us during the week. You can follow it by searching up CLC online on Facebook and on Instagram. That's right. And you know, we believe that one of the best investments that we can make in our lives is to that of our families, which is why on February 6th, we're gonna be hosting the Focus on the Family Marriage Enrichment Conference. We would love to see you there. Make sure you check us out on social media, Spotify, and be sure to download our app. Mm -hmm. That's right. And don't forget that every Sunday morning, we're releasing new kids videos. Uh, Friday nights, we also have a youth live stream on YouTube. So if you have kids in either of those categories, we'd love to have them come join us. That's all for this week. We hope you have a great week. See you next time.